Please have your Bibles open at Psalm number 71. And Psalm 71, in quite a few Bibles, is described as being a prayer, uh, a prayer of someone in old age. Most notably, David, who's likely the author of the psalm, but you will have picked up, as we read the psalm, that there are references to old age, to being older. And so with that in mind, we've been looking into the psalm and we've been following out the idea of what it means to grow old in the grace of God. In other words, to grow old and to keep on being faithful and keep on trusting and to try by our own uh, trust in the Lord and by His grace to try to finish our life, our Christian life, try to finish it well. And that's a challenge as we get older. It's a challenge all through life, but particularly as we get older. And we want to be able to finish well. It's one thing to start the race, quite another to be able to finish it, and to finish it with some degree of um, satisfaction, and some degree of faithfulness, and uh, some degree of honour. And it will all be by God's grace. So this is what we've been thinking of, and... Today we're going to think of the last three principles which David alludes to as he talks about growing old. And (coughs) there were five principles in all, you might remember, but we're uh, thinking particularly of these (coughs) these last three or these second three today. I'll just mention what the five are that come out of this psalm, just for your reminder. (coughs) <coughs> so, first of all, we noted that David had this keen, he had a keen sense of his own condition. And he was aware of his own anxieties, his own fear, and his weakness. That's very helpful. It's not something to be um, shunned, not something to be ashamed of, not something to be resisted. If God gives us a keen sense of our own condition, It's very valuable. It's very helpful. We pray that he does do that all the time. We also noted that David found that he had throughout his life faced unrelenting opposition. Spiritual warfare never lets up. And we had thought about that and how he refers to that because here he is an old man and there are still enemies. Many enemies who are trying to drag him down. We understand both physically know the history of David and spiritually which is what he's referring to here then we come to the third one which is the one we want to think about first of all today and that is what did he do with his old age or what did he make a priority in his old age and what comes through in this psalm is that put it like this he retired and resorted to prayer and worship He retired and he resorted to prayer and worship. Let me think about this because uh, this is what he says uh, in the middle of the psalm. He's alluded to the fact that he's old. He's been upheld from birth. Uh, God has been with him. He's asking God not to cast him off in old age, to continue to be with him. And don't be far from me, he says. Uh, uh, But in saying that, he comes to these verses 14 to 16 and he says but I will hope continually I will praise you yet more and more my mouth will tell of your righteousness uh, and your salvation for I do not know the limits I will go in the strength of the Lord I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only so here he is he is an old man but he's still worshipping he's still worshipping because this is you listening in to David praying to God. And it's been recorded for your benefit and for my benefit by the wisdom of God and the Holy Spirit. But that's essentially what it is. He's saying, regardless of all this, I will still worship. I will worship while there is breath in my body. And so this is very helpful for us because the question arises for us sooner or later, What can I do? 
What can I do when my physical strength is gone? What can I do for the Lord? What will I do? What will I do when infirmities prevail? What will I do, for example, if I become housebound? Or bedridden? Or decrepit? Or immobile? What will I do when my memory fails, if my memory fails? What will I do if my mental acuity, sharpness, wanes? What will I do when I start to realise I'm experiencing the cumulative effects of a life of stress and spiritual warfare? Or when compassion fatigue kicks in and you no longer have the energy to start again, again. What is there for you to do as a Christian then? What will you do? Will you mope? Will you become depressed? Will it turn out to be that you have relied all your life on your job or your partner or your status or your husband or your ministry or your wife your office and these are the things that have given you your sense of self-worth And now they're gone. When you have not realised that the greatest thing is not to have been a preacher or a pastor or an elder or a manager or a director or a deacon or a board member or whatever else. What will you do then? Because one day it will all be gone. What then? What will become of me then? Will you have lost your identity? See, David understands where his identity is. Your identity is that you're a Christian. And that's where you and I are meant to get our sense of self-worth from. That's where we're meant to get our satisfaction from, our sense of fulfilment from, and that can never be taken away. Once saved, always saved. I hope you believe that, and I hope you know why you believe that. Once saved, you're always saved. That's never going to be taken from you. You've got to make sure you are saved. You've got to make sure you have become a Christian. And once you have... Once saved, always saved. And that's where you get your sense of self-worth, if you like, your sense of identity. That's the greatest thing in your life. The greatest thing in your life is not anything else. It's not what you've become. It's not who you've influenced. It's not your bank account. It's not your possessions. It's not how many people you've helped or whatever it is. The greatest thing in your life is that you're a Christian. I've told you the story before of when Don Carson, who is a very popular and good Bible teacher, went to visit Martin Lloyd-Jones as Martin Lloyd-Jones was dying in London. Now Martin Lloyd-Jones, if you'd lived in the 60s, the 1960s, in London, he was the minister of Westminster Chapel for a long time, and he had an extraordinary ministry, uh, extended all over the world, and still get hold of his books, get hold of his tapes. And he was a highly revered figure, evangelical leader. And he was in his home, he was in bed, he was dying. And Don Carson goes to visit him, and Don Carson's thinking, what will I say? wanting to make conversation, he says something along the lines, well, uh, 
I suppose what you miss most is the fact that you can no longer preach. And Lloyd-Jones roundly rebuked him and said, don't you understand that the greatest thing in life is not to be a preacher. The greatest thing in life is to be a Christian. And that's where I'm getting my sense of identity and self-worth from. So, it's a good lesson. David understands that. Do you understand that? Worship and prayer, at the end of your life, that may be the only thing left before you enter into heaven that you can do. And you might have to do that on your own in the providence of God. You might not be able to come to church. You see? But you can still worship and you can still pray and you can praise. And that's what David does. And you want to make it your goal to make sure that the last thing you do on this earth is pray and praise. Because trust me, that is the first thing that you're going to do in heaven. And it's the best thing. It's the best thing. And it should be the first thing in our Christian life. It should be the first thing in our churches and our church programs, in our lives and in our ministries. It should be prayer and praise, worship and prayer. Churches before this particular era we're in, in this country, churches programs revolved around those two things worship and prayer and those two things were the staple, they were the priorities worship and prayer, there were prayer meetings there were worship meetings, yes there were other meetings but these things were the bedrock, the foundation these were the non-negotiables of the churches and they flourished because of it and so when we can't preach or teach or organise or study or lead or go somewhere to serve God, what can we do? We can pray and we can praise. And that's what we're made for. We're made to pray and praise. And you know what? Those things in the end, in eternity, are going to prove to have been the most effective things. Do you think people get converted without prayer? They don't. People don't. You didn't get converted without prayer. Someone prayed for you to become a Christian. Someone somewhere, at some time, prayed for your conversion. And is praying, perhaps. We forget this. Build, how do you build churches? You don't build a church without prayer. Not really. Not truly. Not if it's going to flourish. How do you protect a missionary? The only way you've got to protect a missionary is prayer. That's how they are protected. That's how they are useful. That's how they are used. How are we going to make sermons effective? What makes a sermon effective? Is it the preacher? Is it the illustrations? Is it the text? No, it's not. It's prayer. It's prayer that will make them effective. And what's going to keep you and me from temptation? The Lord Jesus says, it's prayer, pure and simple. Lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from the evil one. So, you, you get the point. It's a very simple point, but it's very important. Don't panic. Don't be alarmed. Don't be frustrated. Don't be undone by the fact that you may reach a time in your life where you are not able to be as active as a Christian as you once were. The point is, you will still be able to pray and praise. And that's the most wonderful thing of all.
Well, let's move on very quickly. Because the fourth principle was this. What you pick up in this psalm is that David has got an eye and a word for the next generation. He's not just thinking about himself. He's not just thinking about his own end. He's thinking about the next generation. Listen to what he says, for example. Um, Again, in those verses from about 16 uh, onward, he says, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, yours Uh, Yours only, O God, you've taught me from my youth. To this day I declare your wondrous works. I'm old and grey-headed, don't forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. Your power to everyone who is to come. You see? Also your righteousness, O God, is very high. So he's thinking about the next generation. He's got an eye to that generation and he's got a word for the next generation. And this is something else that is so helpful when we think about growing old in the grace of God. Have you thought about your opportunities and your ability to influence the next generation, whoever they may be, in your sphere of um, family, friends, whatever? You might think, what can we say? Well, the first thing we can do is we can pray. We can pray for the next generation. We pray a lot for our own generation, especially as we all get older and we have infirmities and we have illnesses and we have cares and stresses and worries. It's good. We pray for each other in those things. But we need to pray for the next generation. And if you can't think of any others, just think of your own Nephews, nieces, children, grandchildren, whoever they may be, uh, in as I say, they, that are connected to you. Well, what can we say? Well, think, it's not so much what we can say, it's what we are. That is going to make a big impact on the next generation. What we are as Christians. What we have learned. And we have learned a great deal. So you and I, if we've been Christians for any length of time, we're really a repository of wisdom and, and practical insight and application. And we've got something to say. We've got something to pass on. And we've got to be aware of this, you see. Now whether they're willing to listen or not, That's another issue. We still have to love rather than judge. But we have to have an eye and a word for the next generation. Who else is going to tell them? Are you you able, are you willing to warn them? Warn them about your failures as a Christian. Warn them about the things you've learned. Come across to them as if you are immovable in your faith in the Lord. Keep the door always open to them in terms of relationship and communication, even in the face of hostility and disrespect. See, this David sees this is so important and it's so helpful for us. While you've experienced his righteousness, if you're a Christian today, you're a possessor of his salvation, you know what that's done in your life, you know how that's turned your life around, And you've seen on every hand and you've experienced what it's like when you don't have those things. And strength, he mentions the strength of God twice. And the wondrous works of God and the power of God. And we have the opportunity. This is much better in some ways than preaching. Because we have the opportunity of communicating the truth after it's sort of been percolated and distilled through our life. And it's, it's coming out through us and it's coming in a relationship and it's coming in a matter-of-fact way. And um, we're living it and breathing it and modelling it. Have you planned your funeral? Do you know what you want said at your funeral? Have you left instructions about what you want said at your funeral? 
because likely at your funeral there will be a lot of non-Christians and many perhaps non-Christian family members and acquaintances people who you've prayed for all your life you've witnessed to all your life in one way or another and what do you want said to them at your funeral? think about that do you want the gospel to be preached? and what about those of our families that are estranged from us? perhaps many of us, any number of us here this morning have that experience we keep the door open the communication open as tempting as it is to just give up and move on supposedly what we're meant to do is to flesh out the attributes of God to the next generation the righteousness with which he says we're clothed we're meant to make sense of the life and death of Jesus to the next generation so you get the idea an eye a thought, a prayer a word in season for the next generation don't give up keep at it don't be discouraged don't be shut up the devil just wants to shut you up and shut you down don't continue to profess and express your faith and point them to the Lord Jesus he is the only solution I mean look at some of the situations young people today get themselves into things that were foreign to us when we were younger now they're having to grapple with them at ages of 13, 12, 13, 14 extraordinary things so point them to the Lord Jesus he is the answer well finally the fifth principle was this at the end of the psalm he's got this little paragraph and there are sort of two ways of taking it let me just read it for you again it's these last few verses listen to what he says he says your, verse 19 your righteousness is very high you've done great things who is like you And then he sort of looks back on his life and he says this You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness, comfort me on every side. With a lute I will praise you and your faithfulness, O my God. To you I will sing the harp. My lips will greatly rejoice when I sing to you, my soul which you have redeemed. My tongue shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. Now this, I think this passage of scripture is one of those passages of scripture where there's a couple of things in view. I think on the one hand you could interpret this in terms of something which is he's thinking of in terms of it being in this life. Perhaps he's thinking of a turnaround even at this late stage in his experiences perhaps he's thinking of revival in terms of a spiritual revival while he's still on this earth while he's still alive and that's a legitimate way to interpret it but I think another way to interpret this is this is really a little picture of heaven and going to heaven Because ultimately, the ultimate way that God is going to revive you and bring you up from the depths of the earth is resurrection. Resurrection. Sharing in Christ's resurrection. And going to heaven. And the saints in heaven will be glorified. Do you know that? You will be glorified. God will be glorified. Your job is to glorify God. But you will be glorified. Romans tells us that. And so we will go to heaven and we'll be glorified and then we'll sing and praise and worship God. But what does all this add up to? Well it adds up to this and this is the fifth principle. That David knew how to fall back on good theology and he knew it was the only thing that would uphold him in the end. In the end. 
when you're facing death, you'll need to be able to fall back on good theology. And it's a great advantage to do that. And David can do that. He's expressing it here. He's expressing his trust in God, God's ability to revive him, to resurrect him. That ultimately he's going to be with God, he's going to be comforted, he's going to be praising God on all hands, you see. So this is good, good, glorious, wonderful theology. He talks about his soul being redeemed and he expresses that. What he's doing is he's making theological statements and he's, as it were, strengthening himself. He's falling back on them, if you like, as he contemplates his situation in old age. Now, that's what we have to do as well and so important. Theology is the science of God. It was once regarded, <clears throat> once spoken of as the queen of the sciences. It's a pity it's not regarded that way now, but in Oxford and Cambridge there was a time when it, that's how it was regarded. It was the queen of the sciences. And it's the study of God, theology, and it's the study of the knowledge of God, and it's understanding and knowing who he is and what he has done and what he will do and who you are in relation to God. But you see, listen, you have a theology. You already have a theology. You already have a view of God and truth. Every sermon, every study, every Bible reading, every Christian book you read has got a theology. Either good or not so good. Biblical or not so biblical. Everything you are taught in church, from the first church you went to following your conversion, has basically been theology, hopefully. And whether it's been really good, solid foundation or not, it's really important to work out. And David has worked out. He says things like, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He's the king over everything. Absolutely everything. That's good theology. God is Trinitarian. That's good. The Bible is inerrant and inspired. That's good. Salvation is solely by the grace of God through faith alone. That's good. You're only a Christian because of the grace of God and the work of the Spirit in causing you to be born again and made a new creature in Christ. Have you got a good theology of conversion? Not just pray the sinner's prayer and you're in and you've got your passport and you've got your insurance policy but a rebirth a spiritual new birth you're a new creature in Christ and then following that sanctification of life a holy life all these things are just under threat these days people are losing sight of these things right, left and centre churches and preachers and people who are generating the theological agenda are losing sight of these things but you've got to have a firm hold on these things evangelism and missions death, judgment, hell and heaven they must not be lost sight of you must have a good theology and make sure you have, test it don't go to a church unless you're convinced the theology that's taught in that church is sound, biblical, good theology. Test what you hear by the Bible, by the Word of God. Because in that day, that's where you're going to take your refuge. That's what you're going to take your stand on. That's what you're going to be thinking about as you draw near to the end. As you stand on the verge of that dark, cold river of Jordan, some of the bygone preachers likened it to and cross over into eternity good theology I'm redeemed I'm saved I know God's word I know what it says I know its promises so fall back upon that so may God give us each one these five things a keen sense of our own condition 
the realisation we're going to face unrelenting opposition. May we be given grace to retire and resort to prayer and worship when the time comes. May we have an eye and a word for the next generation. And may we know how to fall back on good theology as we draw near to the end of our earthly pilgrimage. And we ask it for God's grace and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let me take a moment to pray and then we'll sing When Peace Like a River. But first of all, Heavenly Father, thank you for our earthly lives. Thank you, Father, for your wonderful sustaining grace. Thank you, Lord, once again we acknowledge that our times are in your hands. Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. And so, Lord, we ask that we might be able to continue to shine brightly for you, despite the infirmities and the disabilities, the inconveniences, the trials, the discomforts that may come to us as we grow older. Help us to grow stronger in our love, in our grasp of all it means to have been saved by grace alone, through Jesus Christ. We ask it for his sake. Amen.